This is Research Like a Pro, episode 276, Psychological Benefits of Family History Research. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. The sponsor of today's episode of Research Like a Pro is newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing? Really good. I've been having too much fun with the Research Like a Pro study group. I've been catching up because I've been a little behind, but yesterday I made a lot of progress getting ready to make my research plan. And what I did is I went back to the DNA project I was working on earlier this year, where I found this family in Granger County, Tennessee. I've talked about them a few times and I just wrote the report because I never got around to writing it. And I just feel like I cannot move forward with this project until I wrote up my findings from that DNA project. So it's been fun to go back and see all the matches I found and just put them into a simple report. Oh, that's great. It's really, really rewarding to have something written up from your research. So I have been working on my study group project, which is the Klein Fan Club, and I've been doing the research planning step, and surprisingly, that was really difficult to figure out the priority. I had so many different ideas, and they were going all over the place, and I really had to stop and think, go back to my objective, that I'm just trying to identify these three Klein people and think of what would be the best steps to take because we don't want to have a list of 20 things. We are trying to narrow this down to about five. So usually I don't have that challenge, but because I am doing this fan club, it made it just a little bit more difficult. But I did the same thing. I had to go back to previous research and really think about what I had found. I did tables for each one of them for a summary of known facts, and I came up with an actually a new hypothesis out of all that, which was exciting. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. So I'm excited now to do the research and see if this hypothesis comes true, (laughs) if that's a thing. Yay! It's so great how when we dive into really analyzing every detail we have from the records, that we can come up with these new ways to look at the problem and with kind of a fresh perspective, help us to think outside the box, look at new records, test that hypothesis, and hopefully it will give you evidence to solve your case. I really think it's going to come down to DNA just because this is an area with a lot of record loss, but I'm just hoping that I can get closer to my case. And I even briefly looked at DNA yesterday, looked at matches, trying to find some Klein matches, looked on through lines, and it doesn't look like anybody knows. You know, they the through lines go back to all sorts of different Klein men, and looking at the sources, there's nothing that backs it up. The locations are all over the place. So hmm. it's going to be a challenge, but we're going to get there. Yep, one step at a time. Well, have you tried our Airtable Quick Reference Guide? If not, you can purchase that on our website as a PDF that you can download. It will help you get started with using Airtable as a genealogy research log. It's especially helpful for tracking DNA matches that are relevant to your project. Our next webinar in the Research Like a Pro webinar series is coming up on November 18th with Melanie Witt, one of the researchers on our team who is a qualified genealogist, and the title of her webinar is Origins of Isabella McFall, an Early 19th Century British Immigrant DNA Case Study. If you haven't heard of the QG credential before, it's based in England, and um, so Melanie is more of an expert in England, which is going to be wonderful to talk with her about the British immigrant case that she has. All right, our next Research Like a Pro with DNA study group is in February of 2024 next year. So if you would like to join us for that, you'll want to sign up when we begin registrations at the end of this year. Also, maybe you would like to join us as a peer group leader. If so, please email us or apply on our website. Every Monday, we send out a newsletter. If you want to receive that newsletter, go to our website and click sign up and you can get our email every Monday with new podcast episodes, new blog posts, and other news. 
All right, so we have a podcast question here. If you aren't a male and can't take one of the Y DNA tests, I would love a better explanation of how far back Y DNA can take a male tester. I have no available male relatives because of being adopted. So can you explain the limits it puts on being in a project? Are there other ways to have readings in a project or should I withdraw from a project I joined without any Y test? So let's take these one at a time, this idea of how far back the Y DNA can take a male tester. Well, Y DNA goes back very far, which is why it's so useful. It goes further than the autosomal DNA that we are using. And one of the great things you can do with that is to join a DNA project. So with our client work, we have been involved with a lot of different DNA projects. And there's one in particular that we're working with right now where the clients have a common surname and they have many different branches of this family. And so to either rule in or rule out a branch, they find a test taker who has a path clearly shown in the documents coming down from an ancestor. And in so doing that, they have been able to rule out a lot of branches, which I think is so fascinating. So there are a lot of neat things you can do with the Y DNA. Now, if you are adopted and you have no available male relatives, once you sort out your family group, you know, all adoptees, you can eventually hopefully find your grandparents or perhaps even great grandparents and then you could have Y DNA testing on those different great grandparent lines. So, you know, obviously I'm not a male, but I have my maiden name, Schultz, and I have identified a test taker in my family, a second cousin once removed who is taking the test for me on that line. But I also have a lot of other lines. And so for each of your family lines, you can just identify who would carry that Y DNA and have that person take a test for you. So you could test the line that you're interested in. So absolutely, you can use the Y DNA test in any project. It's just a matter of identifying the person that can take the test for you and really coming up with a research question. What do you wanna know? about any of your lines. Right. And you have to just be shameless and asking people to take the test for you. And <laughs> <laughs> most of us don't really know our second cousins very well. So did you feel super comfortable asking that person to test for you or was it kind of out of your comfort zone? You know, it was really fun because I had connected with another second cousin, actually a first cousin once removed on my Schultz side, and she knew this side of the family. So she said, oh yeah, you should have cousin Joe, not his real name, do that test for you. He would probably be glad to do it. And so I had his contact information. I emailed him and then ended up talking to him. And he knew my dad growing up and he loved my dad. And how neat was that, that I made a connection there that I had no idea that he knew my dad. But it makes sense. They were a pretty close family and got together all the time. So that was a neat little unexpected benefit from having connected with this cousin. And that doesn't always happen, you know, not always is someone going to know your family, but I think it happens more than we think. You know, we often think we're so isolated, we're here in a different area than everybody else, and we forget that they had connections that we maybe didn't know about. That is so neat. And that is such a good testament to the idea that you can ask other people interested in family history to help you recruit DNA test takers who they know. So it's tricky when you're adopted to connect with your biological family. I know that's really hard. And for some people it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. So hopefully you can, if you haven't already connect with some of your biological relatives and then slowly start to build connections and maybe ask for their help in finding why DNA test takers for the research question that you're hoping to solve. So just hopefully you can work together with them to find somebody. And then just another word about joining projects. It sounds like you were able to join a a surname project or some kind of project. Usually these are hosted at Family Tree DNA. If you did join a surname project and you don't have a Y DNA test, then that probably means that that surname project allows different test takers. So maybe if you tested your autosomal DNA, then you could join that surname project. There are different types of 
surname projects and different types of projects at Family Tree DNA. So usually the Y-DNA surname projects can only be joined by a male who has taken a Y-DNA test. So as a woman who has asked a male to test, you can still log in with their kit number and password and see the results. But if it's a true Y-DNA surname project, you have to have the test results of a male to join. But there are other projects out there, so I'm not sure what which type you joined. You could probably stay in it if you are interested in that. You don't need to withdraw just because you don't have Y-DNA if they already let you in. So yeah, good luck with your Y-DNA. All right, well, it's October. It's Family History Month, and this podcast episode is about the benefits of family history. So I thought we would just touch for a minute on Family History Month and how to celebrate it. Our colleague Alice Childs has a great blog post with ideas for how to celebrate Family History Month at her website, alicechilds.com. And some of her ideas were to make a family recipe, which whenever I have to make a family recipe for like a family history dinner at church, I always make um, my great grandmother's banana cream pie recipe. And that was passed down to my grandma, her daughter-in-law, because my grandpa elder loved to eat it. And so she would make it for him. And we all just love making that homemade pudding and with the crust and the bananas in it. It's so delicious. Another way to celebrate Family History Month from Alice's post is to engage in an activity you enjoyed with your grandparents. And her example is crocheting because she would crochet with her grandma. And that reminded me of how my grandma Schultz would teach me how to knit and crochet. And she also taught my son. And so I just have fun memories of doing knitting and crocheting projects with her and so that's such a fun idea to do this month maybe i'll get out some yarn and teach my daughter now that she's old enough and talk about grandma schultz and then the third idea alice had was to learn more about researching your family and to get better at doing family history research which is a focus of our podcast we're always talking about that she also links to the 21 day family connections experiment and if you've never tried that website before it's connections-experiment.com and it has a lot of ideas for how to connect with your family members your ancestors and to do fun family history activities together as a family so be sure to check that out i love all those ideas and it's so fun to think about just small things i think often we feel like we have to do this really big special thing for our family to get them to connect to their ancestors but just small simple things are often just part of our everyday life that we can do so fun to just be more intentional with this idea of connecting well our topic for today goes right along with this and we are talking about something that we love to think about and that is the psychological benefits of family history research and especially with young adults So I think this is absolutely fascinating. And in 2022, three Brigham Young University professors published a paper dealing with this very topic. It was Barry M. Lunt, Kelly R. Summers, and David A. Wood. And their title was Improving Psychological Well-Being of Young Adults by Conducting Family History Research at a Religious University. And that's in the Journal of Genealogy and Family History. So you can read that article, and we'll have a link to that in our show notes. But basically, it's showing that those who participate more in family history work have higher self-esteem, reduced anxiety, and greater resilience. So if you have any young adults in your family, I think those are three things that we would hope for for any young adult who is navigating that really difficult world. And I love that um, Kelly Summers was part of this. She is an accredited genealogist, and she has been a professor at BYU, Brigham Young University, teaching family history for a long time. So it's so neat to see that she was involved in this study. Yeah, I just scrolled to the bottom of the article. The PDF is online for free for anyone to read. And the bottom of the article has the about the authors. So this is interesting because each author is from a different background. Barry M. Lunt is a professor of information technology and cybersecurity in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Kelly is obviously the AG professional. She's a part-time professor of family history in the family history department at BYU, and she has served many years as the testing committee chair for the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists. And David A. Wood 
is actually a professor of accounting, which is very interesting to me that these three came together to study the benefits of family history work. I think that's so interesting. Three different professionals. Maybe as we keep going through the article, we'll learn more about maybe why they wanted to do this. I don't know. I think it's super interesting, though, how those different people found each other. So let's keep going. Well, the article cites previous research that found a link between knowledge of one's family history and measures of psychological well-being. There have been a lot of studies about that. You've probably heard about it before, at least if you've been to Roots Tech in the last eight years, they sometimes will have people talk about that. Well, the authors of this study sought to test the idea that participating in family history research is also associated with positive psychological benefits. So the past research just focused on knowledge of one's family history. And this one was going to try to study the act of doing family history research and see if that also is correlated with positive psychological benefits. So the participants in the study were in two groups, students who were enrolled in an introductory family history course or student volunteers not in a family history course. And each of these participants had a FamilySearch.org account that tracked their contributions. Students completed a survey in the first week of the fall of 2021, that semester, and then completed the survey again in the last week of the semester. Students in the introductory family history course learned about methods for conducting genealogical research, evaluation of information, conducting research in historic records, analyzing evidence, and providing documentation for sources. Any of that sound familiar? You know, all the things that we teach. So did the students who participated in the course report less anxiety and more psychological well-being? The findings showed that yes, those who participated in the family history course increased their self-esteem and reported less anxiety. And the article does have a figure that shows the exact percentages. And the one that really, really stuck out to me was anxiety. And it was a decrease in anxiety by about 17%. That is really significant. And I just remember back to being in college and having so much anxiety. You are trying to do well in your classes and then you've got the social aspect and you're trying to survive on your own you know that is a very anxiety filled time of your life so that's pretty remarkable and then the self-esteem went up by eight percent so how neat is that yeah it's really cool to see this and it's a well-designed study because they look at both a control group who was not engaged in family history research and then a group that was in the class and that they were doing family history research. So you can kind of see the differences there. It's just really wonderful to see that self-esteem is increased and anxiety is decreased when you're engaged in family history. I think it's interesting too that these were students that were doing the course, so they were doing the nitty-gritty stuff. You know, they weren't just reading fun family stories or, you know, cooking and grandma's recipe, like some of the things we've talked about and we'll talk about more, but they were digging into the records. They were creating source citations. They were analyzing things. And I think that speaks to why we love the research so much, because you can lose yourself in it. You know, you can let everything else go and get so fascinated with tracking this family or having that boost of adrenaline when you actually find them finally on the census. There's just some something real about family history research, and I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I think this is pointing to the fact that there is something really great about doing it for your well-being. That's interesting that you say that because when I think about the benefits that I personally gain from learning about my ancestors... It reminds me of a lot of the things that they teach in psychology about, you know, when you're feeling stressed or depressed or anxious, it helps to be grateful or to serve other people and caring about your ancestors, learning about other people, trying to uncover the details of someone else's life takes the focus off yourself and puts it on them. And I think that really helps because then you're not worried about your own issues and problems and struggles, you're able to think about somebody else who maybe has been forgotten in history and 
you get the joy of rediscovering them and committing the information you find about them to paper so that they're remembered. And that is a service. That is a wonderful thing that we can do for our ancestors to make sure they're not forgotten. And it does make me feel happy to do that. (laughs) Me too. And especially when you discover someone that was forgotten, sometimes there's a child in the family that nobody found. It reminds me of my great-grandfather, the William Houston Schultz family. There was one census that had a little girl named Sarah on it, and she must have died before the next census. No family stories ever talked about little Sarah. And I found that census and realized that there was a child who died young that had just dropped off from anybody's memory. You know, that is so neat and that's so touching when you discover those people. There really is a connection to them. So I love that. That's so great. And I think another thing that the article highlights about why family history helps individuals' psychological well being is that they're identifying with a larger family and they feel that they belong. So let me read a quote from page 67 of the article. The authors said, we postulate that participating in family history will enhance psychological well-being by enhancing group identification of the researcher with his or her family, both living and deceased. Social identity theory hypothesizes that belonging to groups is a critical component of one's identity and that a sense of social identity can give purpose and meaning to life. Specific to psychological well-being, Research has shown that strong group identities are associated with positive self-esteem. This is particularly true for family identification. The greater the individual identifies with the family, the greater their self-esteem. That makes sense. So when you're researching your family, you're for sure identifying much more greatly with them than if you knew nothing about them. I love that. I love that research is playing out like this, that people are really looking at this with controlled data and controlled groups. Well, let's take a minute and do a word from our sponsor, newspapers.com. Newspapers.com is your ultimate resource for discovering your family's history. Explore more than 800 million newspaper pages in their vast collection spanning three centuries. Newspapers.com is your gateway to exploring the past with papers from the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. Trace your family's journey and uncover the extraordinary tales of your ancestors through newspaper stories, birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, and much more. For listeners of today's show, newspapers.com is extending a discount of 20% off on a Publisher Extra subscription. Just use the code FAMILYLOCKET at checkout. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. All right, so in light of these findings, We definitely would want to try to help our younger relatives increase their knowledge of family history and involve them in our research. I think that it's so fascinating that this helps them to feel more a part of the family, which in turn increases their psychological well-being. And Nicole, you and I have totally been involved with this for so long, and we have a lot of fun blog posts and resources on our website. So we decided for this episode that we would just highlight some of our favorites because we've done a lot of different things through the years. I know when I was growing up, my parents were very involved in the research and my dad was writing letters to his relatives in the South. My mom was gathering stories about her pioneer ancestors. So I grew up seeing, seeing that, but I didn't really do anything except for, you know, took one little course at church and compiled a book of remembrance, which was great. It was my very own. And I just always knew that I was part of this bigger story, part of this bigger family. But then once I started researching, it was just amazing to learn more. And, you know, while you children were growing up, we would do different little things. And I know that we had those school projects, I believe it was eighth grade, where you had to do some kind of a family project can't remember exactly what it was but we we did some fun big boards and did some research connecting connecting to different lines on the family so that was a neat opportunity yeah that was the cultural fair I loved that it was so fun to choose something special to research and make a board about like a science fair board I did Charlemagne because 
you know, my aunt had told me I was related to Charlemagne and gave me that paper with the line back to him. So I researched all about Charlemagne. <laughs> and I believe that we sewed a dress that was for that as well. Was that dress part of it? Um, like the princess dress? Maybe. We did have to sew a dress in Mrs. Dominguez's class. Well, it was one of the projects we could choose from. She was such an amazing teacher. She had all these fun different project ideas that we could do for learning about medieval times, and I chose the one where we sewed a dress. Okay, so that was just for medieval. Is there a connection to Charlemagne in that dress that's still hanging here in the closet? (laughs) (laughs) The cultural fair, I couldn't remember what that was titled. And I know for uh, your older brother that we chose the Hollingsworth branch of the family on your dad's line, and we traced them to Ireland. And this had been previous research, but we went down to the public library in downtown Seattle and looked up some books and found some articles. And that was so neat to put together that research on that line there were Quakers that came from Ireland to Pennsylvania and then eventually made all the way out to Idaho so you know we did some things in our family just because they were school projects so how great that teachers do this and you actually went in and talked to an eighth grade program were they eighth graders it seems like they're in Arizona and the teacher has a whole family history type unit yeah it's been really fun I've done that a few times here in Arizona to different schools, but there's one teacher in particular who does a family history unit and he encourages them to build their family tree. They all get ancestry free trials and they use it for a month. And then at the end, they have to create a big science fair type board about one thing they discovered. They have like a theme that they choose and, and it was really fun to go in there and teach them a little bit. We listen to a lot of people speak about genealogy and one of the things that I've heard a lot of them say is they got started because of a school project, because they had to go ask grandma about the family, or they had to do an interview with someone or learn if there was, you know, this scenario in their family, and that got them hooked. So that's kudos to teachers who are incorporating some of that into their curriculum. Yeah. Well, some of the fun things we've tried at our house are... A family history geography game. There's a map game that used to be out. It's like a trivia about capitals and the location of countries. And I just made my own cards that had questions about our family. Where was great grandpa born? Where was so and so living or whatever? Um, where did grandpa serve in the World War II? And just a chance for us to practice learning about our family with geography. So it's kind of like learning both of those two things. Another game we love is Wheel of Family Fortune at the BYU Family History Tech Lab. And that one is just a fun game where everyone guesses letters and they try to guess the ancestor's name and it's connected to the family search family tree. So it pulls in names of your ancestors from the tree. And my kids love that. Another fun thing we did is at the Elder Family Reunion several years ago, each of the 10 children of Grandma Grandpa Elder prepared a family history skit with a story from our family history that they liked, and it was so fun. Everyone chose different ones. The one that I enjoyed that we did was about one of our ancestors on Grandma Elder's side who dressed up like Santa Claus at Christmas in his small Idaho town every year and made wooden toys for children and handed those out. And and it was just kind of a fun thing to imagine. So those kids were just so memorable. We have the videos of them, and it's just fun to look back on those. And it makes the family stories just really stand out in your mind. They really do. There's some. There were some really funny skits, and I don't remember a lot of about you know some past family reunions. But I think everybody remembers those funny skits and how creative people were. So that was a great one. Yeah, and then as far as getting our kids involved in family history research, I one time I thought it would be fun to have my son help me transcribe an agricultural census because he really liked animals, but he was too young. He was kind of bored. (laughs) I printed out the schedule for him and he was like making marks about how many cows and how many sheep and swine the person had and it was funny but he 
does really love writing stories and gathering information into books on like blurb or shutterfly about our ancestors. So he's actually made a couple different books with information about our ancestors. So I have just noticed that everybody has different interests and talents and they can be applied to family history in different ways. And the way that one child likes to engage with family history is by making books and he just thinks that's really cool. So, well, I think it's really important to take what the child or the young adult, whoever is doing it and apply their interests, their talents to something having to do with family history. So I love that. I know that I have enjoyed doing a lot of different things through the years. And one of my favorite memories is when your family visited once and I opened up my trunk. I have this really neat trunk that I inherited from a great aunt and it's full of treasures. It's full of all sorts of heirlooms and oh my goodness, we took those things out and had so much fun. Your children just were enthralled with all the things like my dad's navy pants are in there and little pieces of jewelry that I inherited from grandmothers little dishes like my own little some of my own little special toys from when I was little and to me I don't really think of them as being that amazing but your kids thought that they were really cool which yeah they were (laughs) they were from a whole different era so that is really a fun thing and you know someday I will be giving out those treasures to different family members but I also really love around my house just decorating with heirlooms and using heirlooms for various things like I have my great-grandmother's compote you know this glass bowl basically on a on a stem and so sometimes I'll get that out and serve trifle in that and talk about the story behind it or we have you know other things that have been inherited come down through the family I like to serve things in special dishes and talk about those so I really enjoy just trying to share in little small ways some of the stories and things through heirlooms. Love it. And then finally, just kind of to wrap this up, I think it's also really fun to try to involve teenagers and young adults in some real research just in a fast, fun way. And one of the things that I designed when I was working with the youth in our church was something that I called Mission Possible, you know, after the Mission Impossible program. And so I made up these little sheets of specific little missions that they could do that would only take maybe 20 or 30 minutes each. And so they could choose their mission and they would sit down at a computer, log on to Family Search, and then attach a source or correct something on an ancestor's page like the the place so that it was the standard anyway I had a bunch of little missions written out with specific details about how to do it so they could basically do it on their own because I had found that working with the teens they really didn't want an adult hovering over them or being beside them telling them click on this click on that you know nobody likes being told that but having a little cheat sheet, a little paper in front of them, and they were doing it and exploring and learning, they loved it. And they were trying to do as many missions as possible, and they really had fun doing that. So, you know, I wrote a blog post about that, and, and several other people have emailed and said, we're doing this, it worked great, our kids loved it, I updated it a little bit, we played the Mission Impossible theme, made everything dark, and anyway, they've had a lot of fun in different areas taking that same idea so if you work with teens you might want to check out Mission Possible because it gets them into doing some real research some real tasks but just in a really kind of fast and fun way. I love that it's so fun to engage in learning about family history research and finding out about our ancestors and sharing that with our loved ones and seeing their faces light up when they learn something interesting to them and when they can learn skills that they can carry throughout their life for connecting with their ancestors. It's just a wonderful thing. Right. 
Well, we hope everyone listening has been encouraged or inspired to do something to help that generation of youth or teens or young adults to connect with their families through some type of family history research. There's so many different things that we can do. And, you know, we know that it works. We love doing that. And we hope that you guys can all try something as well. So thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.